seconds to 1993. Happy New Year's Rockin' Eve 93. This year, 2023, I'm hitting a big milestone. I'm turning 30. For those of you keeping track at home, that means I was born in 1993, a banner year for video games. We got some all-timer classics like Doom, Star Fox, Myst, Star Wars X-Wing, The Legend of Zelda, Link's Awakening, Ridge Racer, Secret of Mana, and Putt-Putt Goes to the Moon. But these games represent essentially my only knowledge of this entertainment medium from 1993 prior to beginning work on this video. So a couple of months ago, I decided to dive into the magical encyclopedia of the World Wide Web and generated a list of 91 games games published in the year 1993 that I wanted to try. From that list, these are the games I wanted to tell you about. Alkahest, developed by HAL Laboratory, published by Square. I'm just putting Alkahest here simply to let you know that the opening cutscene reminded me of Bionicle. That's it, just had to get that in here. Moving on. Balljax, developed and published by Namco. This should be eSports. The game is simple. Two crabs, two conveyor belts, and balls. Lots and lots of balls. The goal of the game is to use your little crab's claws to grab your opponent's balls over to your side and keep them there until the timer runs out. Simple in concept, a bit more tricky in action. But for what simplistic gameplay there is, it makes for some awfully tense and exciting gameplay moments, and they should broadcast it on ESPN. Batsugan, developed by Toa Plan, published in Japan by Toa Plan and in Europe by Taito. I'm trying not to put too many shmups on this list, but the 90s was kind of the last big heyday for the genre, at least in regards to their broader cultural impact, so that's why we're talking about Batsugan. Batsugan does little to iterate on the scrolling arcade shooter formula, but it doesn't rock any less because of it. It's got great art and great music, and any game where I can fire this many bullets at once is going to be awesome. Cyber Sled developed and published by Namco. This needs a modern remaster. Cyber Sled is Armored Core and Mario Kart's Battle Mode and Tron and BattleBots all thrown into a blender, despite the fact that it preceded Armored Core and BattleBots by several years. Cyber Sled is very much an arcade game first and foremost. Matches are short and fast, the progression is quick, and the gameplay relatively simple. However, it oozes with character. The sled designs all rock, evoking the art of someone like Sid Mead. The music slaps, and I desperately want this game on Switch yesterday. Fire Striker, developed by Axis Art Amuse, published in Japan by Hect, and in North America by DTMC. Fire Striker was not what I expected. The opening cutscene and aesthetic presentation of the game evoke myriad other top-down RPGs or top-down adventure titles like The Legend of Zelda, but when the game actually began, I realized it was pinball. It was combat pinball. Now, in premise, that sounds kind of neat, but without more robust control over how you can actually hit that little ball around, that lack of control can manifest in some frustrating enemy encounters, and sometimes when you know you need to destroy this one final thing to complete the level, but the ball just won't cooperate. But it's fascinating to look at something like Fire Striker and see in it the DNA that would go on to form the genetic makeup of something like Creature in the Well. In the Hunt, developed and published by Irem. In the Hunt is a very sub-pixel shoot-'em-up. While most vertically and horizontally scrolling shooters of the era were about airplanes or spaceships or giant robots, In the Hunt takes the fight underwater, placing you in control of a submarine and placing above and below the waterline a thousand different foes hell-bent on cracking your hull and sending you to Davy Jones' locker. The art direction in In the Hunt is spectacular, and definitely worth a playthrough just to take in all the great art. Jutsu Senkai, developed by Tam Tam, published by the Enix Corporation. 
Like a proto-advanced wars with a bit of Nazca of the Valley of the Wind and Evangelion flavor, Junta Senkai is a little isometric tactics game that is dripping with flavor. I have no idea what's actually going on, even with the help of Aeon Genesis' phenomenal ROM translation, but it's still a fascinating little peek into the history of the genre, especially to look at it against more modern titles like Advanced Wars, Wargroove, or even Into the Breach. And these little combat cutscenes are delicious. Metal Marines, developed by Namco, published on the SNES by Namco, and on the PC by Mindscape. Metal Marines is a bit like Battleship with tower defense. You begin by doing a little bit of base building on your little island, but soon the air raid sirens begin going off, and enemy troops begin landing on your shores. You'll discover as you launch your own troops that you have no tactical information about the enemy base. It's up to your landing parties to chart as much of the enemy island as they can before they die, so you have a better idea of where to send fresh troops next. Much like any good RTS, the fight is won when you destroy the enemy headquarters. Easier said than done. Ranger X, developed by GAU Entertainment, published by Sega. I really want to talk about Ranger X, despite the fact that I was really bad at it for a long time. The controls are weird, even for a 90s Genesis game, but like with a lot of the entries on this list, it's just so cool. The art is incredible, and some of the boss encounters are wild. You play as this little mech guy, but you've also got this bike counterpart that you're actually able to combine with for different combat capabilities. It's a really cool system once you get the hang of it, and you get these great wireframe animations prior to each level. Just phenomenal stuff all around. Let the carnage begin! Rock and Roll Racing developed by Silicon and Synapse, published by Interplay Productions, in Japan by Namco, and on the Game Boy Advance by Blizzard Entertainment. Rock and Roll Racing is such an oddity. It's a rather boilerplate isometric racing game, but the real charm of Rock and Roll Racing, if the name didn't clue you in, lies in its soundtrack. There's no amount of wonky, fixed-camera racing that won't be helped by an equally wonky MIDI arrangement of George Thorogood's Bad to the Bone. No bit of slippery slamming into walls that isn't made better by chunky, MIDI Paranoid by Black Sabbath. and no amount of engine overheating that isn't cooled by Deep Purple's Highway Star. Yeah, I think Botsugan has a boss called Deep Purple. That's, that's neat. And I think beyond the music of it, I was likely predisposed to enjoy rock and roll racing because it reminded me of LEGO Stunt Rally. I would have played this so much if I had an SNES when I was a kid. And apparently there is a definitive edition which adds more songs, but just uses the actual studio recordings instead of these weird MIDI tracks, which I think loses some of the charm. Towards a first place knockout! So there's 10 games from 1993 that I think are worth your time. So do me a favor, and as a birthday present for me, play one of these and let me know what you think about it down in the comments. And if these 10 video games weren't enough, subscribe to Subpixel for even more great videos down the line. Leave a like if you liked this video. And as always, I'm Jake Terrio, and this has been another episode of Subpixel Spotlight.